Thank you, Steve and Margie, for that come to the altar. What a blessing it is to be able to have you set worship God and uh, challenge us to um, be faithful to God. I just put this one as an extension. I have 10 pages of preaching, so I hope you're ready for two hours with message. After worshiping God and just hearing that come to the altar, I think we could just go ahead and stand here for a while and, and hear the message of God. I want to um, also thank Pastor Carlson as uh, he... Um, continues with the, um, I choose to be uh, uh, faithful, I choose to uh, control my thoughts, and this series has really challenged, uh, challenged me, and uh, I, I think a couple of weeks back, I didn't have to translate, and you kind of get more of the message when you don't have to translate, and you just soak it all in, and I think it was the day when it was really cold, and it was uh, snowing, and we were even thinking, should, should we cancel, or just, you know, many people uh, weren't able to come, but... Um, it's just a, a continuation of those messages, being able to be challenged, to um, take God seriously. And today I would like to also uh, challenge you with the message that Joshua gave to the people of Israel. He gave this message, uh, this, this challenge to the people of, uh, of, uh, of the Israelites in a time when, even though it was an exciting time, because they had already uh, crossed the river to uh, conquer the, uh, the promised land. These were exciting times for the people of Israel, but they had defeated, because they had defeated their enemies and claimed the promised land. Each of the tribes had received their inheritance, and now they could settle down and enjoy life a little. It was a time of hope and prosperity and blessings. But for the people of Israel also, it was a time, a very dangerous time for these people. There was danger that they would forget where they came from how they had gotten where they were and what the Lord had done for them. You know, as a church of God, as people of faith, sometimes we can also wander off in our faith and forget where God uh, brought us from. We say, well, that was the people of Israel. They were slaves for 430 years in Egypt. They, they did see the plagues uh, come down to the Egyptians and, and, and they were liberated. Uh, um, Jesus just saved me out of darkness. That's all it was. But literally, what it, but it was basically the same. Coming out of slave from the enemy up to be a servant of God. There was a danger that they would fall into a state of complacency. Brothers and sisters, could it be possible that as a people of God, we can also be so blessed that we could just be complacent? We can neglect uh, uh, um, the Word of God we can neglect prayer because we have it all. We've done it all. We've sent missionaries. We, we supported um, Gideon. We, we, we give our tithes. We come faithfully and we figure, um, would that be enough? Would the enemy just stop attacking us? Is the battle over? These were dangerous times for Israel. In the midst of the situation, Joshua stands up to deliver to the people a challenge from the Lord. God wants them to dedicate themselves to Him and to His work. He does not want them to try to live for Him on one hand and, on, and to the gods of Canaan on the other. He wants wholehearted dedication or nothing. And that is the message that we will see today. Let's consider also that just like in the time of Joshua, the church is living in dangerous times. We are seeing the church develop an appearance that is more like that of the church of Laodicea in Revelation. Remember, the church that lacked nothing, they uh, considered themselves rich. Uh, and as a matter of fact, they went by the, by the certain um, uh, logo uh, as it was. They would say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have no need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched and miserable, says the Lord. A church that has everything it needs except Accept the presence and the power and the glory of God. Far be it from us to try to uh, 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 trust on, on our own strength, right? Far be it from us to say, well, we made it to the promised land. Let's just, you know, uh, build our great homes and, 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 and let's trust that nothing's going to happen anymore. Let us not be complacent. Just as the Lord issued a call through Joshua all those centuries ago, 
for his people to make of their to make up their mind as to whom they will serve. So he issued the same call to his people on this day. Let's take some time this morning to look into these verses and hear the call God is giving to us this morning. I want to preach today on the message titled "Let's Serve the Lord." Let us pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity of being part of a local body of believers. You have called us out of darkness into your church. You have redeemed us by your blood, by your son's blood. Thank you. We hear your call, Father. Therefore, we are here. We want to hear from you. And as we have uh, worshipped you, bring, uh, as we have brought our, our tithes and our offerings, now, Father, we, we ask that may our attention be um, completely on your word. And may your word challenge us to serve you even better for your glory and for your honor. Thank you, Jesus. As we consider this uh, <coughs> message of commitment, and as we read uh, chapter uh, 24 of Joshua, verse 14 and 15, consider the words and the urgency that Joshua tells the people of Israel. And he says the following, Now therefore, he says, Fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river in, in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods with which your fathers served that were on the si other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Mi casa y yo serviremos al Señor. That was a conviction that he had. Joshua was willing to even put himself as, as an example. Commitment. Commitment. Each one of us has a story of how we came to know Christ. Each one of us can, can just play now, uh, uh, compare how, how God rescued you, maybe from... from uh, from alcoholism or, or from different issues in your life. And we understand that when Jesus calls us, he calls us to commitment. When the Spanish explorer Hernando Cortes landed at Veracruz, Mexico in 1519, he was intent on conquest. He was there for a mission. He had commitment. And to assure the devotion of his men, Cortes set fire to his fleet of 11 ships. With no means of retreat, Cortez's army had only one direction, and that was to move forward and conquer. Cortez understood the price of commitment, and he paid it. He understood, if there's no way going back, we might as well continue from. Remember when the people of Israel had just departed from Egypt, and, and, and they came up ready to conquer the land, and they sent uh, uh, some, uh, 12 spies. Let us consider the land. Remember their first... Uh, uh, um, report or their first uh, reaction to the report of the of the spies, they figured, well, if there's giants over there, if we look like ants compared to them, or I think it was another animal, I don't know, like we look like uh, uh, they call them in Spanish grillos, grasshoppers. Yeah, that's what it was. Let's go back, back where? You remember where they wanted to go back? Back to Egypt. If there's no commitment into believing that God is going to provide the promises, let us go back. The people of Israel had, had uh, transitioned from uh, uh, um, the Israelites as conquering people to now just enjoying the blessings of God. Therefore, Joshua kind of gives them some, kind of give, give them a run through of their history. In the first couple of verses, or uh, the first 12 verses of uh, chapter 24, he literally goes through them step by step when Abraham was called out. And he says, Then Joshua gathered, at, in verse 1, all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for the judges, and for the officers. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said, Thus says the Lord your God, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served. Who did they serve? Other gods. They didn't serve me. I called them out of a, 
idolatrous people, and I brought him and made him into a nation. I blessed him. I protected him. In verse um, 7, it says, um, <clears throat> verse 7 says, So they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. And, and he brought them to the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes saw that I did what I did in Egypt. Joshua was challenging them to consider what God had done when he opened the Red Sea, when he sent the plagues, when he blessed them. That He said, even you didn't have to use your sword to, to conquer these people. Uh, uh, um, God was in control. He says in... Um, um, in verse 12, it says, But not with your sword or with your own ball did you have to use. And he's given them a history so they could be reminded about God's choice. He was, Joshua begins his remarks by calling them to a time of, uh, of remembering. And he wants them to remember who they were and where they came from and what the Lord had done for them. And it would do us good to think back on those things ourselves. Because the challenge that Josh was going to give is a challenge not just individually, but a challenge for the family to contemplate God's power first in their lives. They, reminded, they are reminded about God's choice and call of Israel, how he redeemed them and delivered them from Egypt, how he manifested his power. They are reminded of the victories they have enjoyed and the blessings that have been theirs because of the Lord's work in their lives. Could it be possible that um, we have been uh, Christians most of our lives that we forgot what it was to be a pagan? I hope <laughs> that, you know, we could say, well, I forgot what it is to smoke. I hope, you know, somebody could say, oh, I forgot what it is to even use profanity. You know? Good riddance, right? We need to contemplate what the Lord has done for us. Remember where He found you, what He did for you, and how, how He has blessed you, how He has worked on your behalf. Even for His provisions, how He provided His presence. In, uh, um, in verse uh, 13, of that same chapter, it says, <clears throat> I have given your land for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyard and olive groves which you did not plant. These are the blessings that God has given to his people. And after a while, maybe they could be so complacent and thinking, well, God did all this. Could we let our guard down now? They are clearly partakers of grace and more than they could ever imagine. For 40 years, the people of Israel, uh, they were wandering as nomads. They had no, no, no property to claim. But now, they have been there at least 30 years, maybe 40. Joshua was 110 years old. He knew that his time to come up to be with God was soon. And he needed to challenge them to continue being faithful to God. Therefore, he confronts them. And this is where we take our message. Verse 14. Joshua's command to the people was to fear God. To clean up, clean up their living, their lives by putting away other gods. Listen to what it says. It says, verse 14. Now, therefore, he says, he says, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. This is a command that God's people need to take need heed today. That is, we need to have reverence and honor Him for who He is. He deserves to be respected and loved by those who He has redeemed. As we have His Word, I remember uh, uh, the first couple of years uh, when I first um, um, came, uh, uh, became a Christian, I, I, I would hold the Bible with such great regard, uh, great regard that I would, not that it was a magic book, but sometimes I would feel uneasy when somebody would just put it on the floor, you know? Or like they would put it somewhere and then their feet would be like on the table and I'm thinking, why would you do that? It is God's revelation for man, isn't it? Maybe I was a little uh, um, uh, um, legalistic or 
Who knows what it was? But isn't it true that when we first come to know the Lord, we're like, we're passionate? I mean, I would get mad if somebody ate without praying. Like, how come you're eating without praying, right? I, I'm beside that now, so <laughs> it doesn't take it personal. But, you know, passion, commitment. Joshua says, fear God. Don't ever let the presence of God be so common that uh, we can just come to with the people of God or the, the temple of God and just say, oh, yeah, we're here. You know, it doesn't matter. No. God meets his people where the worship of God is, isn't it? Isn't it amazing that sometimes we could come and we could be so downtrodden and just a uh, 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 downcast, but and then when we start praising God, when we start hearing God's word being preached or start hearing uh, uh, his message, it kind of revives us and gives us life. And it's like, wow, you know, that was great. And you know, that is the spirit of God working within his people. That is commitment. That is passion. So, just fear God, but also put away your God, your other gods. All those things in our lives that come ahead of the Lord, that the Lord needs, that we need to put away. It's to serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which you and your father serve in the other side of the river. The word for serve means to fulfill the role of a slave. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, it says, Or do you not know what your, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. Serve Him, Joshua says to the people. Could it be that even though they had already conquered the land, even though they had already kicked most of the Canaanites out of the promised land, could it be that they probably just kicked them out, but they stayed with, with the idols, with Asherah, with Moloch, with, with maybe even the idols from Egypt? And then, you know, nowadays, you could say, well, brother, we're brutal. this. Uh, we are past that stage now. We don't have the actual image of an idol. We don't have the calf. We don't have this. But you know what? Idols, doesn't have, they, they don't have to be an object directly. Anything that takes away from our holy devotion to God uh, could be considered an idol. You know? Within the past, um, let's say, 25 years, the um, internet and all this social media and all this uh, entertainment has, has exploded so much so we could use it for good. Many of you use the Bible uh, in your phone and all that, but you know, it, it could distract you from the actual uh, intake of, of God's Word. Could that be your God? Could sports be your God? In the Cifuentes household, we, we, we tend to be a one sport minded family, all we do is soccer, um, and, and, um, and I was kind of grateful for that because we just, had, we just had to go to the same fields all the time, so it was either high school, junior high, and little, you know, it was all there, but I could see how sometimes even that could be taken away from our actual purpose in life. Sports are good. Golf is good. I don't know how to play it. I'm pretty sure... When I retire, I'm going to ask Clint to show me. Because I hear he's pretty good. Right, Howard? <laughs> you know, all the sports are good. But we could have those as our God and say, you know, this takes away from my total devotion. Because remember, complacency just keeps us out of, you're okay, I'm okay. But Joshua refused to be complacent. He understood that the battle wasn't Jericho anymore. The battle wasn't uh, Ai. I don't know how to say that, that, that uh, high, the next town after Jericho, in Spanish is Ai, which they actually lost the first battle. But uh, the, the Canaanites weren't the battle anymore. See, the next battle that the Israelites were going to fight was a battle within themselves. The battle between, will I serve God or will I serve the other gods? And I believe, brothers and sisters, that God wants us to continue that battle and be faithful to God. Putting aside anything that might hinder your communication with God. 
He was willing to confront them. He was willing to say, <clears throat> as for me and my house, he was willing to take leadership as a man. Oh, brothers, nowadays they're trying to redefine what a marriage is. And that hinders what a family is. He, he confronted them with a choice. Joshua challenged the people to choose who they would serve and to get on with serving God. This morning, the same choice stands between, uh, before us. A couple hundred years after Joshua said these words, you know, uh, Elijah confronted the Israelites also on Mount Carmel. Because it turns out that they were still battling the same thing. Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, go along with him, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Do you know why? Because inside, they had their idols. Until God manifested himself with bringing down fire from heaven to show who was God. And then they understood. We need some Joshua's in our day. We need some men and women who will settle it in their hearts that Jesus Christ and His Word, and His Word will come before everything else in life. And I like the fact that uh, Joshua, he doesn't just say, "Well, I'm going to serve God. Hopefully, my wife will come. Hopefully, my kids will." Now, by this time, Joshua wasn't young. He was already a father. By this time, I'm I'm willing to uh, uh, say that Joshua was a grandfather probably even a great-grandfather. He had a conviction in saying, as for me and my house, as for me and the next generation, I'm going to be an example. I want to be able to not just instruct my, instruct my kids, but be an example to my grandkids and my great-grandkids that God is God and that we must serve Him with a full commitment. Why would anyone Listen, why would anyone think uh, that it is evil to serve God? Listen to what it says here. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord. <laughs> That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because how could it be evil to serve God? Right? I mean, isn't it obvious that it is good? It is a blessing to be able to serve God? To raise your kids in the fear of the Lord? To instruct them? to discipline them, to, uh, to love them. He says, verse 13, 13, 15, And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods with your father serve on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Somehow, there's people who think that we can live in both worlds. That we can live with one foot in the church and one foot in the world. Just in case Jesus doesn't come back for us. <laughs> As if there's doubt. You know? I don't want to miss anything from the world, but at the same time, I want to be blessed by God. Does that work? No, does it? It doesn't. God will discipline His people. And even at the end of this chapter, the Israelites do say, we will serve God. But listen, I want to take you to chapter 2, verse 10 of Judges. In uh, verse 7, actually, it says, So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Now, did it work? The covenant that they established in Shechem? Yeah, at least during the life of Joshua and all those who have seen the works of God, people were faithful. But listen to what it says in verse 10. After they buried Joshua, he was 110 years old. And, and then it says, when, when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, 
another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. And chapter 2 ends, and it starts, all oh, this roller coaster of faith, unbelief, idolatry, and they were uh, 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 taken by other nations, where other people would come and, and, and steal their crops, and then faith again, and it was a roller coaster of faith. Isn't it true that sometimes even our faith kind of dwindles and we're like, oh, sometimes we're strong in the faith and then all of a sudden we're, we're in valleys spiritually? How is it that a generation can pass without not knowing what God had done for them? Today I want to challenge the, the young couples, the young families that are raising kids. I see you guys with the uh, diaper bag and, and all this, and I remember just barely 10 years back we were there. They're nice times, trust me. Enjoy them for right now, because and then they're going to get bigger and uglier. I mean, I mean, cuter, cuter. Yeah, that's it. Here, take an example. Just kids, please stand up now. <laughs> but check this out. Listen, our next generation, they need to know about God. And you know where they learn primarily? At home. Family devotions. The church, its responsibility is to support that which we as parents teach them. We teach them an example. We teach them in family devotions. And one of the key verses for the people of Israel is in um, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 9. And listen to what it says. And I think in the, in the Mishnah or this uh, uh, tradition for the, for the Jewish, uh, uh, once they do their, when, when, a, when a boy turns 12 in the Jewish community, uh, what do they call it? Mitzvah, mitzvah, yeah. I was going to say it in Spanish, but thank you for the English version. Sorry. No, so it says in Deuteronomy 6, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is for everybody. Everybody should love Him. But these words which I command to you shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to who? What does it say there? To the children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, maybe after breakfast, after dinner, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them as signs on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Nowadays, we can say, you should put it as a, uh, as a window in your, in your phone, on your tablets, on your laptops. Make sure that the Word of God is always being read. Why? Because the world, the enemy out there is going to eat our kids alive if we do not if we are not intentional in giving them the Word of God. Now, please hear me this. I just, I'm not saying we've got to be perfect families. I know uh, as pastors, sometimes our families could be like targets of, you know, say, well, look, this is the pastor's kid. Yeah, I know my kids, trust me. <laughs> and when pastor and I pray, and, and you know, uh, we understand that dynamic. It's not about trying to be perfect families, but it's trying to recognize that God wants us to raise our kids and to instill in them and love them. So when they come to Kids Quest, to Awana, when they come to all the children's ministry, to youth ministry here, we're going to support that which you as parents are instructing your kids at home. But, but, if you figure, well, I take them to Awana, I take them to kids and to, to youth ministry, and I'm going to let them take care of it. That's not going to work. That generation will not. I'm not saying that it can't. God could do a miracle. God can do a miracle. But if you instruct a child when he is young to the scripture of God, isn't it more likely that he would treasure it in his heart? Confronted by the challenge, we need Joshua's in our days. We need men and women to be faithful in prayer for their kids and to instruct them in the Word. We need men like, like Daniel, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Does your life stand as a challenge to godly living? As Joshua encouraged? Or as an encouragement to godless living? Because, you know, it's either one or the other. Joshua was willing to be a, an example to be followed because the stakes were high. As I mentioned, the battle was coming. And it was not with a sword or an army. They were used to those kind of, uh, kind of battles. 
it was a battle of the heart. Who will the Israelites serve? Their decision would make or break the blessings of God on the people. Will the next generation know about his, God's mighty power and provisions? The admonition Joshua gives us is about his decision and commitment that is home. If we don't take this challenge seriously, brothers, our next generation will not know the Lord and his mighty acts for his people. You know, the church in general, as um, in the past 30 years that I've been a, a believer, um, I've been in Latin America and here in the United States, in the United States. And um, at least from the Latin American perspective, you know, uh, they're predominantly a, a Catholic tradition. And, um, and they tend to uh, uh, figure, okay, well, everybody is like us. Okay? So w- when somebody comes to know Christ, you see it automatically. I mean, he's not a wife beater anymore. He doesn't drink uh, liquor. And, and, and people know that. I mean, whoa, you know, he became a believer. Because at least within the Catholic tradition in Latin America, you could be both. Be Catholic and be a wife beater. Not that they approve of it, but eh, it's, it's, a, it's a well-known within the community. Okay? So uh, um, uh, the, the difference here in the United States is that since the United States has been blessed mightily by the first, second, Great Awakenings. I mean, uh, man, like uh, Billy Graham, Charles Finney, uh, Jonathan Edwards, great preachers, theologians, uh, 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 um, um, books, missionaries that have, have been going out. And, and uh, here in the United States, being Christian is the norm. Just like uh, being in Mexico and they say, you are a Guadalupano. If you're Mexican, you're Catholic, regardless of whether you're a partisan. Or they call you a partisan if you become a Christian. Uh, but, um, but the norm is, if you're uh, 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 from Mexico, you're Catholic. Therefore, you know, uh, uh, somebody will come from, from over there to over here, and they will say, well, if you're from the United States, you're, automatic, you're automatically an evangelical Christian. Now, me and you, or you and me know that that's not true, correct? I mean, there's a lot of everything <laughs> going around like that. But, but... We are so accustomed and so blessed and so rich that God could even bring us. And I'm talking about us as a church here in the United States to be so complacent that we figure, well, everybody's Christian, isn't it? Why challenge the congregation? Why draw the line in the sand? Why challenge young couples to love God and to instruct their kids. Because these things are essential for the next, for the future of the church. As parents, we should we should love our God and teach our kids. Deuteronomy four nine says, Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen. And lest they depart from your heart in all the days of your life and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. A couple of chapters after that, in, Deuter- in, in chapter 11, it says, verse 18 and 19, Therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children in speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Brothers, if... If our kids are going to learn about God, they need to be challenged and committed. They need for us to say, Son, I'm going to turn up the TV on Saturday. Cartoons, mornings and cartoons, it's going to be tough. But I say, I want to tell you something. And start teaching, open the Bible for them. It will make an impact on them. Why? Because it will be commitment for them. What will you do with that commitment? What will you do with that decision that Joshua said, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. The decision is yours. Does that mean that I'm challenging you because I haven't seen you serve the Lord? That's far from it. I know 
that there's people here that serve the Lord wholeheartedly. But maybe you're still wondering, should I be wholeheartedly? Maybe a couple of you might be saying, should I? A young student in China decided to play a trick on his, on his teacher one day. And he caught a small bird and cupped it in his hands and put it behind him. He then approached the teacher with his palm in his hand. And he would ask the old man what he had in his hand. And if he answered, he was going to ask him. And if he answered correctly, he would then ask the teacher if the bird was alive or dead. If the old man said alive, then he would crush it so the bird would die. If the answer was dead, he would just release the bird. Kind of mischievous. This is an Andre, uh, Enrique, by the way. He was from China. But he probably would have done something like that. Upon approaching his teacher, the young student said, Old man, old man, come here. What do I have in my hand? The man responded, A bird, my son. Is he alive or dead? The boy asked with a grin. The old man thought for a moment, and then he replied, The answer to that question, my son, is in your hands. It is in your hands. The same way I tell you today, you have a decision to make, either about Jesus or about your commitment to Him. You can be neutral. You can't be neutral about a man who claims to be the only way. For I am the way, the truth, and the life, said Jesus. Your friends and your family can't make this decision for you because it's, it is in your hands. May we continue to bring our family, our kids, in the presence of God, family devotion, because the world out there is tough. Be active in your lives. Let us pray. Father, Joshua said it right, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Oh Lord, as a family of believers here at Grace, we trust that your Holy Spirit will continue to challenge us, to instruct us, to discipline us when we are wayward in our spiritual life. When we doubt your blessings and your and your promises, oh Lord, thank you for the opportunity of hearing your word. May your Holy Spirit impress on us a dedication and a commitment to you. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen.